well, we're going to talk about a serious topic right now, the plight of women in the correctional justice system. We've got women in prison. First slide here. I'm going to let you know about the American problem. It's uniquely American because, as you can see, we have the dubious distinction of being the most incarcerating nation on the planet. The U.S. has the highest incarceration rate, with about 2.5 million people currently in prison. Second behind us is the uh, eastern African nation of the Seychelles, weirdly enough. There are about one million U.S. women in prison, jail, on parole or probation currently as we speak. And the fastest growing population of prisoners in the U.S. happens to be women. There was about an 800 percent increase in women prisoners from 1980 to 2006. Drilling down a little closer to home here in New York, orange in the apple, there are five correctional facilities exclusively for women in uh, New York State. Bedford Hills is the uh, maximum security place here. 76,000 plus women are currently incarcerated right here in New York State as well. And 76 percent of of those women behind bars are mothers. One interesting fact that we also found was that 20 percent of those women who are mothers in prison were directly homeless before being incarcerated. So some very daunting numbers on a very real problem that we're facing here in New York, especially when it comes to women. Now, Melody. Mm, very daunting. And I would say it's not sexist to say women in the criminal justice system face many hardships that the other half of humanity would have a difficult time even imagining. Behind every inmate with a number is the story of a woman, perhaps a mother, who, going by the numbers, is likely to have been a victim of violence herself. What are the issues that drive women into the criminal justice system, and what can be done to lead to their rehabilitation and eventual return home? For answers, we've called on Susan Gottesfeld, I hope I'm saying that right, yes, Gottesfeld, Executive Vice President for Program Operations at the Osborne Association. Welcome, Susan. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. And back at the table is our friend Esmeralda Simmons, Executive Director of the Center for Law and Social Justice at Medgar Evers College. Thank you for joining us, Glad Esmeralda. To be here. So we just heard that 800 percent increase. I believe Esmeralda was saying it's actually 900 percent increase really? now. From 2006 till even now. Wow, that's a lot of people. This could go to either of you. What's what's behind this spike in women going to prison? Well, it's quite simple, but now hopefully it's going to change. Mm -hmm. It was the quote war on drugs, mm -hmm. and of course the other item which is constant in this society is poverty. Uh, the third item, which most people recognize, is that most women who have been incarcerated have been abused, um, have been in abusive uh, situations at home, so violence is part of their, of their lifestyle. Uh, you put that combination together, uh, plus, obviously, the uh, poor school system, lack of jobs, and women are doing things that they maybe would not have done before, and authorities are now throwing them in jail where they might have given them probation before. And fully 50 per 53 percent or more of the women in the prison system are women of color, African-American, followed by Latinos. So this is also a racial component to the well, problem. Well, not only that, in New York, you have to understand, in New York State, most of those women come from Brooklyn, mm -hmm. Manhattan, Queens, and the Bronx. Like mm -hmm. Five neighborhoods That's where they come from. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 But, but, and more than, more than 70 percent, I would dare say more than 80 percent, are women of color. So New York State is completely skewed. Uh, and there is a very dual system going on mm -hmm. about who gets probation and who doesn't get probation. Right. So when we're looking at what we often hear about one of the interrupters in that cycle when we talk about this uh, whole school to prison pipeline, that face of these talks is predominantly male. We always talk about young men and young black men in particular, but your, uh, the Osborne Association has some programs that are aiming to disrupt that and, if you don't get it disrupted, at least help people to get back into society after. We certainly do. And I, I think um, women, typically in the criminal justice system, as in many of our social systems, are an afterthought. They're sort mm -hmm. of secondary tier. Um, and it's, you know, you can see why. I mean, the the we have a huge prison population in the country and in New York State, and it's overwhelmingly male and increasingly young male. Um, so it's easy to focus programs and diversion and legislation around men in the criminal justice system because right. we are so overwhelmed by the numbers of men we're incarcerating. Mm -hmm. 
But um, women are unique. The reasons they enter the criminal justice system are different. The family situation they leave behind is often different. They're usually the primary uh, caregiver, where that's much less often in men who go to jail and prison. And so it's very important to um, shape our practices and policies and our programs to meet the unique needs of women and not apply all this thinking we've done around men in the criminal justice system to women and really to their children. Yeah. And so at the Osborne Association, uh, the programs we have that are really highly focused on women are around motherhood, parenting, and visiting. Um, and so we do televisiting with children. They come to our office in downtown Brooklyn and in South Bronx on Westchester Avenue. Mm -hmm. They can basically there. Skype. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's secure, uh, so it's not actually Skype. But right. they can visit moms and um, in Albion Correctional Facility, which is, I mean, basically on the Canadian border. It's about mm -hmm. as far away from New York City and as you can, you can get and still be in New York. Um, and we also fly children to visit their moms at Albion oh, twice right. a year wow. through a partnership with JetBlue, which is, and St. James Church and yeah. Temple Beth Elohim, which is fantastic. But for some of those kids, it may be the first um, time, memorable time yeah. of seeing their mom, because a lot of these kids were very little when right. mommy was arrested. Right. And um, yeah, so whenever we think about women in the criminal justice system, we have to think about their children, we have to think about their trauma. So, right. yeah. as a Meralda, on the legal side, mm -hmm. when people, when women are before a judge, are these special things like thought of as mitigating by sentencers or? No. Okay, <laughs> so you're going to jail? Like no, everybody. you're going to jail. Yeah. Uh, right. The plight of the children, uh, the fact that our system, are, it's, it's, there's so many right. systems hooked up, and, and I'm gonna focus on the foster care system mm -hmm. because children whose mothers are incarcerated, who don't have other family members, who are willing to take them, go into the foster care system. Right. And now there is a push for 18 months, get those children adopted, termination yeah. of rights, and get the children adopted. So um, mothers could go into prison and actually lose parental rights and come home and not be able to be the uh, legal mother get, yeah. of their child. But there's, there's so many issues involved in this uh, legally. I was very happy to see that they, that they passed in 2009 the anti-shackling law. I mean, how inhumane can we get in this country? State You're, Senator Velman at Montgomery. Actually, was right, in this district, right. she has been fantastic on this. And not to say that they are complying with it, mm -hmm. um, but yes, right. And that was shackling during childbirth. Right. So they have continued to shackle Literally. during Literally right. shackled to a right. gurney while right. you're, oh, you're in the act of while you're labor. Giving birth. Exactly. Yeah. Active labor. And also right. postpartum. So you would have women transferring from hospital mm -hmm. back to prison, uh, handcuffed carrying a baby carrier, like a car seat with an infant in it, yeah, with uh, ankle chains maybe too. It's very it's, it's just dangerous and, and, and upsetting. And, and for those of us who have had childbirth, mm -hmm. it's difficult, folks. You don't need shackles to make it any worse. It's hard to right. run away. Yeah. Right. So is the DOC providing any support? For women at all incarcerated oh, they women have to families? legally yeah. I mean okay. they have to and they're okay. supposed to be providing all well-being care but uh, let's just say that while New York has been in some states there are still some major medical issues particularly around reproductive rights yeah. and m medical attention how soon you get medical attention so something that could be prevented like a cancer if if you don't get to see the doctor on time or if you only have 15 minutes that's allowed yeah. uh, maybe it doesn't get investigated maybe it moves forward to a different stage of cancer and then of course we know it could wind up being a fatality lots mental illness is rampant mm -hmm. rampant and is not not adequately treated at all. And many women wouldn't be in prison if they were in their right mind to begin with. Treatment. Right. So, Susan, this is also an election year, and I know a lot of people are saying, put away your violins. These are people who committed crimes. Yep. No matter what their circumstances sure. were, they acted against society. So why should they be given special consideration just because of their femaleness? I mean, I, mm. I don't think that we advocate for special consideration. Mm. I think we advocate for smart policy and practices. And um, separating a, a child mm -hmm. from their mother to hold the mom accountable and punish her is, uh, it has a lot of collateral consequences. There are a lot of ways to hold people accountable, to set them up to live responsibly going forward, and to keep families and communities intact. And not only are they better for the children who are 
always innocent in these crimes of their parents, right? It's just smarter. It costs a lot less. Um, and I think, you know, it's a difficult situation. A lot of the women that we work with in the courts are—their crimes are related to their abusive situations, whether it's intimate right. partner violence or, you know, a, a actual physical violence, coercion, verbal abuse. And it's a very foggy lens mm -hmm. through which to look at culpability. And it's challenging for the court. So are but recidivism rates of. different for men versus women? That's a good question. That's, that's, that's about the same. It's about a little better. A little better, because som sometimes women have support systems to go back to that men do not. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes the people who are taking care of their children while they were incarcerated have, have a vested interest in, in, in they're doing well. Again. They don't have a better time getting jobs mm -hmm. when they come out. Uh, they don't have a better time getting into higher education. And the fact that the state had cut uh, mm -hmm. training programs uh, and at some point, for a point in time had even cut college education or GED programs yeah. in the wow. prison system did not make the situation better so you know it does it doesn't they they have a slightly better time but yeah. this is really hell I know Mel was sharing an example earlier about a place in Florida that seems to have a good track record that you were uh, the prison in Florida the only maximum security one there the one in Hawaii? Yes, Hawaii. I'm sorry, Hawaii. It's Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. Same thing. It's right. Any place warmer country. than Hawaii. Warmer than this with flowers, <laughs> right? right? Do you guys know about that prison yes. in Hawaii? Yes. That's, you know, it's he, he, really he, described as a sanctuary. They right. use there with the pool Honua. What? Um, like are are people treated like studying humans? this place? Is anyone trying to well, kind of they recreate? Like they, they, they sort of treat Hawaii like some people treat Texas. That's mm. fair. Mm. This is yes, I would say every time you go to a criminal justice conference, there's a presentation on the Hawaii uh, model <laughs> for, for women, and yeah. so we, we've learned about it a lot. I mean, I think um, in order to do a model, a proven, effective yeah. model like that, there really has to be a cultural shift right. from punishment to accountability and healing, right? Well, and one of the things they were talking about was they forgive them immediately. Right. Sort exactly. of when we come in, we start a cult. We actually have a chart that we uh, pulled some of the things that they use just to show folks how they sort of language yeah. themselves right. into it. Right. So in a regular correctional facility, mm -hmm. they refer to inmates by exactly. their last names, where they say, consider it being or Ms. Number. Smith instead right. or or just the number. Dehumanizing and referring to staff by sergeant in their name. And yeah. instead of calling them cells, they call them rooms <laughs> mm -hmm. or blocks or pods mm -hmm. or blocks or walks or wings or pods. So I this like is. I like the one instead of lug car, right? Yeah. Right. Take it to us again. Yeah. Take you know, it how does that sound, yeah. lug car, you know? Yeah. So this is an example of languaging yourself into behaviors that change. But I wanted to talk about how male mm -hmm. correctional officers are taught to interact with females? Are there <laughs> special considerations given to teach men how to behave in an environment full of women who are behind bars? I, I, they, they get training on, yeah. on dealing with women inmates. Yeah. Um, but it's the, the attitude that's, that's really lacking, the lack of respect. They're not taught to respect them as women. Mm -hmm. They're not taught to even think of them as human beings. They're taught to look at them as dangerous creatures, so to speak. So, so that, that causes more friction. It reinforces the, the uh, brutality and, and, uh, uh, that they ex that, and violence that they um, felt before they came into the prison system. And it makes them feel, for many women, uh, being around a man, man at all just upsetting. triggers, just triggers uh, yeah. upsetting. And the one thing that many people are, uh, not to say people, that the system is moving toward that is that is good. And I, I have to applaud the closing down of prisons that are going yeah. that's going on. And I have to applaud some of the uh, the humane things that are happening, such as having women in the uh, uh, cleansing areas, the shower area, women security officers there mm -hmm. rather than men. Personal care. <laughs> Personal care. I mean, you know, let's think about it. how would you like to have a man standing there while you took a shower? I mean, I think we would really like to see more trauma informed training and approaches incorporated. Um, for correction staff, for men and for women. Mm -hmm. You know, women aren't alone in experiencing trauma. There's some unique triggers and considerations. Um, but also, you know, in order to shift the culture to a trauma informed place, there also has to be care given to the correction officers. That's right. And what they go through right. on a daily basis and what women correction officers experience in the culture of their That's work right. and, and also, you know, securing 
men who are in jail and prison. And right. so you, you can't just look at one side of a correctional situation and say, this is the side that's wrong and this is the side that's, we have right. to fix it. Right. Uh, there needs to be a whole, thank you. Shift. Yes, and, and harm, shift. harm creates And they're harm. all con con all of them, the, the officers, the mm -hmm. correction officers, and, and, and the people who are incarcerated, they are all constantly in fear of violence. Mm. Well, we are going to have to leave it in that fear of violence, uh. unfortunately. <laughs> but this is just a little teaser for our uh, March 26th town hall, where we're going to be, I'm sorry, March 24th, we're going to be talking about the criminal justice system and reform, and we encourage you guys to get down to the Brick House for that. We certainly hope you'll be there. We'll be there. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you in advance for that. Yes.